Canadians are hopeful people. And look, I, I got to say it because I've been watching this summer and Sean's a good looking guy, but I got to tell you, the obsession that Pierre Polyev has with this guy is just weird. And like, I don't know what's on with that, but like enough already. And quite frankly, like let people do their jobs. He's the best housing minister we've had in a generation. And for, quite frankly, as, as you've heard from the prime minister today, the economy uh, has changed. And as minister of jobs and official languages, it's my responsibility to uh, read the labor market and see what changes are taking place. And to make sure that along with my colleagues here, building houses faster than ever before and making sure that our immigration levels continue to build our economy, we're making changes changes today to the temporary foreign worker program. And with the changes that we already started in March that took place in May, uh, we will have with today's changes about 65,000 fewer people participating in the temporary foreign worker program. Why is that important? It's important because we want to see Canadians and re permanent residents have access to uh, entry level jobs in what has been known as the low wage stream uh, up to now. And we want to make sure that Canadians have access to those jobs. It's also an important part of our overall program to have more compliance in the temporary foreign worker program, and also to stamp out abuse. And so working with Minister Miller on Lovell's plan, taking 65,000 people out of the temporary foreign worker program is an important step. Uh, the announcement made today by Minister Boissonneau and by the Prime Minister is part of the piece of the puzzle related to the reduction of, uh, of temporary workers from 7 to 5 percent that we are announcing, that I announced earlier this year. Uh, this year's level plan to be announced in a couple months will take into account and give a fuller portrait of temporary residents and permanent residents in this country. Uh, there are more measures to be announced that will be coming up. This isn't the last measure to be announced. The measures that I announced at the last cabinet retreat with respect to international students, uh, we are still measuring the outcomes, but for now we have seen a significant reduction in uh, international students and obviously the postgraduate work permits that will come with them. Uh, that isn't the end of the measures that are to be put into place. The Bank of Canada has said that we need to take additional measures. That is absolutely correct. So more of those should come uh, in the early fall. So uh, this is an important aspect today of making sure that we have a system in some areas that's gotten overheated, that is under control. We'll continue to do that to make sure that the people that are here temporarily uh, are properly welcomed here, but the welcome to Canada obviously is not boundless and we have to make sure that it makes sense in the current economy um, for Canadians obviously, but also for the job market as it const continues to constrict and we won't hesitate to take additional measures if necessary. Sean. Excellent. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, look, one of the things that I uh, have come to uh, understand over the course of the last uh, nine years serving as an MP is that uh, you do really well when you listen to people in, in your communities. Uh, when I talk to people about the role of immigration in Canada, they remain uniquely supportive of the need to welcome newcomers, to bolster our healthcare system, to make sure that they help drive our economy. Uh, but they also want to have their concerns, which are, are very fair concerns, reflected in government policy when it comes to making sure that we have the capacity to deliver social services uh, that people depend upon, that our healthcare system can provide for a growing population, uh, and that we have enough homes for the people who uh, move to our country. Uh, over the course of the last few years, we've been through some very interesting times. Uh, as we were coming out of the pandemic, we saw the news articles being written we're focused on uh, a record labor shortage with a million jobs that were open in the economy. Uh, we took a decision as a government at the time to listen to businesses then who said that thousands of them uh, may potentially close, uh, that could impact the livelihoods of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Canadian workers. Uh, as the landscape has shifted, we're no longer dealing with the same labor shortage that we were dealing with uh, even just a couple of years ago. Uh, so too, the policy landscape has to shift. Uh, we expect that uh, the changes made today could potentially reduce the pressure on uh, tens of thousands of, of housing units right across the country. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we're going to continue to do by reflecting the feedback that we hear from Canadians, uh, by looking at the uh, need to continue to welcome uh, permanent residents in numbers that are, are controlled and that we can build enough homes for, uh, but that we also change the way we deal with our temporary programs, because as those of you watching may know, uh, the temporary programs have historically responded not to a level set by the federal government, but by the demand uh, that we see from institutions in the case of the International Student Program and employers when it comes to the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. When we see certain institutions applying for, in some instances, tens of thousands of study permits without providing the housing necessary for the people who are coming to communities, we need to change course. Uh, when we see employers who are, uh, despite uh, changes to the rate of unemployment, uh, making a, a, a significant number of applications to bring workers here for jobs that Canadians could do, we need to change course. So today's uh, uh, move is going to have a positive impact, both for the employability of young people in particular, as potentially going to relieve uh, pressure on housing markets in certain parts of the country, and I'm looking forward to seeing the impact of these measures roll out in the months ahead. Thanks so much.
Good afternoon, Ministers. Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. Uh, Mr. Miller, I believe this question is for you. The Prime Minister said today that the Cabinet is considering, as part of these meetings and going forward, changes to the permanent resident numbers. Can you just clarify if that includes possible changes to the 2025 and 26 numbers, or if it's for after that? I'd say, Marika, all options are currently on the table. It's not a discussion that's been had by Cabinet yet, but we're looking at a number of options that Frankly, Canadians have been talking to us about on the permanent residency numbers. Often at Cabinet, we consider options uh, that are pretty narrow. This will be a broad set of, uh, of alternatives to have a complete discussion on. Look at where the country is currently, look at where the country is going, and making sure that, that we adjust. And so it'll, it'll include um, potential options on the upcoming year as well. And just to clarify, what is the trajectory that the government wants to bring numbers down to? Is it pre-pandemic levels? You know, we've seen so much talk about how the line has gone up much faster in population growth since the pandemic. So are you trying to bring it back down to the pace of growth that's pre-pandemic or something in between? Can you give us a sense of the goal? Well, uh, look, I think fundamentally we're dealing with uh, a conundrum that the Bank of Canada has itself laid out quite clearly. Uh, we have seen significant growth in in the economy that is due almost solely to immigration in the last few years, uh, and that entrance into the workforce driven almost entirely by immigrants and immigration. This is a good thing. Uh, the IMF has said time and time again that we have avoided recession thanks to immigration, but it's come with a conundrum in and around affordability in and around housing, and making sure we address that properly is something that every Canadian expects us to do uh, and not be dogmatic about it. As I took this position, I, I, I I told people that I'm not someone that uh, is beholden to any form of dogmatism, very open uh, to making changes if, if the economy dictates it, if the, the social fabric dictated it. And so we've heard, I've heard from provincial premiers, I've heard from my colleagues, counterparts in other provinces, I've heard directly from Canadians about where they see the direction of immigration going. And I think they're asking us to adjust. So the number of options that we'll be looking at, and it's not set in stone yet, Marika, at Cabinet in the, next, uh, in the next few weeks will include a very, very robust discussion about where we think we should be going in the next, uh, in the next three years as we set those level plans and respond to the criticism that we've legitimately gotten from different sectors of society, which is to give a fuller picture of the temporary residential picture of Canada because we know that a lot of those people are, that are becoming permanent residents are already here and that impacts the analyses that are made by the Bank of Canada as they adjust and, and um, and fixed interest rates and giving them some clarity on that is key uh, to, to a very basic thing like setting the interest rate. Hi Ministers, uh, JP Tasker from CBC News. You mentioned the bank. The Bank of Canada also published in its monetary report some data on unemployment among immigrants. It's now close to 12 percent. It's much higher than the overall unemployment rate. Does it make sense to you personally to maintain the levels that you've currently set for permanent residents? Does it make sense to accept 500,000 more people next year when the people who are already here, many of them, are without a job? Well, it's an active conversation that is, is and will continue to be had with Canadians, with, with economists, with members of cabinet. Uh, what makes sense to me personally is frankly less important than what makes sense uh, to the businesses that I'm talking to, the chambers of commerce that I'm talking to, the peoples at the doors that we're talking to, uh, to cabinet members. And we need to look at a range of options that, that does consider the current levels that we've set uh, and, and options potentially to reduce. Uh, and that's just smart politics. Uh, it is smart policy, and it's something that I think every Canadian expects us to do. If you look at the market that has contracted significantly, uh, the jobs that were needed three years ago are no longer needed anymore. And so uh, the expertise that we bring into the country, and let's take a step back, the permanent residence levels that we have is about 60% driven by economic migration, which compared to the U.S. is only about 25%. So they envy us in our ability to bring in talented, high-skilled folks. Uh, there are needs that are no longer there anymore in the low-skilled wage programs, but also in other programs. And so we need to look at that soberly and adjust on the fly. Um, we also have to be careful of not throwing the country into a recession because, again, it's not 
a perfectly elastic adjustment when you look at the labor there are some jobs that Canadians will not do uh, there are some jobs that Canadians should be doing that are occupied currently by temporary foreign workers and so that adjustment isn't necessarily linear or obvious and it's something that we need to account for as we make these adjustments and announce to the public every year what those three-year levels should be whether it's 500,000 or something else you and again this year we will not attain 500,000 right um, still 485 that's still the 485,000. That's correct, yeah. Um, you mentioned experts. Mike Moffat, who's going to present before Cabinet uh, one day this week, um, has said that the government should eliminate entirely the low-wage temporary foreign worker stream and not just make tweaks around the edge, but just get rid of it because it's driving down wages. People who are coming here are willing to work for less than the prevailing wage. It's been particularly problematic for young people this summer. They haven't been able to get a job as they have in the past. Why are you still maintaining this low wage stream? Uh, why, why is it something that you feel you have to preserve? Yeah, and again, I, th I think Randy will, ask, will, will answer this more completely, but again, it's the opinion of one person, even though he speaks to us and is an authority in the field. Uh, we disagree with them on some levels, we agree with them on others, but Randy can answer the rest. Uh, John Paul, I'll say that some of the rhetoric out there is just downright unhelpful, and we're talking about making sure that we have businesses in rural and remote Canada that can actually stay open. And if you're talking about one out of 10 workers, um, or two out of 20 workers that actually keeps an inn working, and that inn is the only restaurant in that community, and that community is where the people who work to build that community reside uh, on a temporary basis while they're building up that community, that's not something that I'm prepared as, as jobs minister to see disappear in rural and remote Canada. And we've seen other governments have knee-jerk reactions to this program and shut down the low-wage stream entirely, only to then turn around and have to bring it back entirely. So what have we done in four short months is we've gone from 30% down to 20%, now 20% down to 10%. And the changes that we're announcing today, which normally would take between four and six months, we're going to get done in up to four weeks. We are serious about these changes taking place, and I think it's really important for people to understand that I am going to, we are implementing a refusal to process in all census metropolitan areas that have an unemployment rate greater than 6%, because to Sean's point, the economic fundamentals have shifted. Like after COVID, we had to do things differently as a government. We did those things, we had a million job vacancies. Businesses were going to shut down if we didn't move. So we moved. Now we're at about 525,000 job vacancies. So we're going to move in the other direction. And the TFWP was always designed to flex with the economy. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're reading the economic data and we're responding. To your point about newcomers and, make it, and youth, both of those unemployment levels are at about the same rate, and that is too high. And so I want y young people in these jobs, I want newcomers in these jobs, I want labor mobility across this country, I want provincial barriers out of the way, and the other people that you should be asking about this are my provincial territorial counterparts in the labor market development space. We transfer almost $3 billion a year to them so that they can do the training for newcomers and Canadians and permanent residents to get to the job market, and we need more coordination in federal priorities to get that work done. Uh, Minister Miller, based on the changes that have been announced today, when do you think the numbers could sort of course correct and, and even out more when it comes to temporary workers and international students? And do you think these changes could have been done any earlier? Look, there's plenty of room to, uh, for revisionist history. Uh, you know, you look at some of the labor needs that we had coming out of COVID, every single sector crying for, uh, for, for people, temporary work. Uh, we even had sectors of the economy, significant labor shortages going into COVID and it just got worse. So I, I think we adjusted properly given the circumstances. There are areas and we've moved to adjust them like international students, the issuance of postgraduate work permits that have gotten overheated. Uh, there are areas in the low wage stream that have been overutilized. I, I think the era of uncapped streams of ways to get into Canada is long is coming to an end. Uh, that's a matter of proper planning and uh, and forecasting. Uh, there are economies that and industries in Canada, including post-secondary institutions, that have benefited wildly from having international students or from having temporary workers here working in the economy. And as Randy mentioned earlier, there are some communities in Canada where the existence and presence of temporary workers is existential to the you know the continuance of the of a vibrant community. Um, I think the adjustments were made in a, in a timely fashion. 
there are more to be made and the, and the reduction has to be done in the right way. Many economists have clearly said that if we don't do this in the right way, you risk damaging the economy and in worst case scenarios throwing Canada into a recession, which is not what we want. There's no question that we do need to adjust uh, and adjust nimbly as Canada, like other countries, deals with, uh, with a social reality but also an economic reality of a constricting labour markets in areas where the people that we traditionally brought in uh, don't have jobs and they can be frankly filled by Canadians. But as we've seen, and you can just go back as to what certain premiers were proposing during the pandemic to use students to go pick apples or whatnot, it just, in some cases, it doesn't make sense. So uh, we have to be able to compose with reality and that's what we're doing. And can you talk about any reflecting that you've been doing on the state of the party and what you want to see change moving forward? Not with you guys in public. That's that's for damn sure. <laughs> uh, but sure, you know, look, I, I think we, we have to have this. Uh, Tonda's laughing. I, <laughs> the reality is we have to have these r conversations behind closed doors. It, it, it's important for the health uh, of the party, the, the cohesion that we have in cabinet in particular. Uh, we have a number of political conversations coming up, and I expect that to be um, expect them to be quite robust. Prime Minister is, uh, has been quite active throughout the summer, speaking individually to caucus members to talk about their challenges, where they see the country going, um, whether they want to run uh, for, uh, during the next election. I think this, that's exceedingly important. As a, as a leader, that's what you would expect of them. Uh, but we also have our points of view as cabinet ministers, and we, we, we make them known, but just not in public. Ashley? a summer of listening to your constituents, <coughs> voters across the country, and even from watching events unfold south of the border in those campaigns. What's your takeaway in terms of your own way forward? Well, certainly, I think, and I think sometimes we borrow a little too much in our political rhetoric from the U.S. Uh, we have our own political dynamic here that is not necessarily readily comparable uh, to the U.S. Every, you know, I know a lot of eyes are focused on, on the U.S. election. I'll focus a little more on what Canadians are saying. Uh, I spoke to to the to to the postmaster in uh, an office in in his riding the other day, and what she wants to see is uh, is a, is a country and a leader with vision, and someone with solutions, and not someone with slogans. Um, anyone can come up with cheap slogans, but people actually have to come up with uh, with with a vision for the country. The, we've set Canada on a course uh, coming out of COVID where. We have dealt squarely with issues around affordability that no country situated similarly like us uh, has been able to escape, whether that's uh, robust positioning on daycare, whether that's uh, making sure that Canadians can make ends meet with the child benefit. That is, uh, those are staples of, of what we have been putting forward. Canadians want to see more of that. And they want to see uh, a prime minister that, that cares about his country and doesn't spend his time shooting his mouth off. If you look at the opposition in Pierre Polyev, this is a guy who spent the last 20 years uh, cashing a government of Canada paycheck. What is the one thing that that guy's ever done uh, in the one job that he's ever held in the House of Commons? And no one can nail that. Uh, he throws out a lot of slogans, uh, but sure, uh, you know, anyone can throw out a slogan, uh, cut the crap, shut your yap. I could shoot that off all day, but it's not something that I really want to be seen as, but that's how he's seen, as someone that just throws out all this garbage. And that postmaster that I spoke to, um, she's through, she sees through that crap and she keeps telling me that. And she, I don't know if she's a liberal or not. Uh, I bought some of the farm eggs that she was selling for $5 <laughs> a crate, but it, it's, 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 it's kind of neat to see people kind of cluing on to the fact that they want to see more in a leader than, uh, than just garbage slogans. They want to see concrete actions and anyone that wants to be the Prime Minister of this country has to have a vision for Canada and I think um, the Prime Minister is doing a great job in making sure that he's reflecting what Canadians are saying and hearing. Donda and Ashley, um, I've been reflecting on the summer on uh, the personal on personal tax in politics. I don't know if you know that there was a, a very nasty car parked outside of my house for over six weeks that was affiliated with, uh, it was definitely Conservatives. Uh, they would switch their cars every three, four days to comply with bylaws, hateful slogans on the car. The police did their job. That car is no longer there. But we've got rising rhetoric in this country that is uh, putting at risk good people being in politics. And we're in full recruitment mode. I want to see excellent people of, uh, of all genders, of all races and backgrounds in politics. And, and I think we all have a responsibility to make sure that we're letting people know that this is a noble profession, that we're here in the service of Canadians. And I want to make sure that that, that hopeful, optimistic sentiment of Canadians continues because Canadians are hopeful people. And look, I, 
I got to say it because I've been watching this summer and Sean's a good looking guy, but I got to tell you, the obsession that Pierre Polyev has with this guy is just weird. And like, I don't know what's on with that, but like enough already. And quite frankly, like let people do their jobs. He's the best housing minister we've had in a generation. And quite frankly, I think you're going to see us build more housing than ever before because that's the plan that we've laid out. And Sean's at that helm. And I think we got to talk with people um, on.